And good morning, this is Pete and Dorcas Vicente with you on this uh, March the 18th, 20th, okay, yeah, March the 20th, uh, 2022, <laughs> so glad you can join us. We're Cornerstone Assembly Independent Pentecostal right here in Cambridge, Maryland, also Vicente Ministries. We meet at a church called The River, we're not affiliated with The River, but we meet at the church called The River at 415 McCammon Street every Sunday night and every Thursday night at 7 p.m. So come on out for a service. This Thursday we continue our study in Psalm 119. Uh, right now we're taking uh, one Thursday off per month to do a question and answer time, so keep that in mind next time, next next one rolls around next month sometime in April. So, uh, but we'll be in the stanza called Va, V-A-U, or if you want to spell Wa, that's fine, but uh, I prefer Va for various reasons. Don't go on and get into that. All right, but we are in the uh, Chronicles. Well, that's a different book is it not now okay and uh first of all uh there's a lot of people out there well we've been pastoring since in cambridge since uh, 1994 we started the church right oh uh, 92 all right 92 time flies when you have it was one of those dates <laughs> now nah, anyhow i'm pretty sure it's 94 but that's i guess it doesn't matter we've been here since 1990 plus and uh, during that time, we also had Bible studies before that time and all that. But a lot of people here in Cambridge, and I'm not knocking the place, but many are on disability, and uh, and all they they you know they uh, social security disability, and usually it's because of mental situations, things like that, or it could be they're stuck in a wheelchair, things like that. And uh, but when we get saved, we realize that we're not really disabled; we are enabled in Christ. Amen. And there's always something for us to do. Uh, now, this message was also preached. Well, this was preached at Cornerstone some time back. We're, we're doing it now. And this was also presented to uh, Mallard Bay uh, a couple years back. Not a couple years back. Maybe eight years back at Mallard Bay. And once again, we have some people at Mallard Bay or other places too. Or other uh, places for rehabilitation, also senior care, uh, where people think, well, I'm old now. Uh, worthless. No, you're not worthless. If you're born again, if you're saved, there's always something for you to do. Amen? Jesus wants you to serve him all the time. Praise God. In any way possible. You might think your prayer doesn't mean much, but it does. You might not. Th you might think that your praise might not mean much, but it almost certainly does. Uh, in fact, when the night comes when no man can work, if we're still stuck here, that's probably the best thing we can do is just praise God anyhow. So, but uh, let me go on here, basically. So you always have something to do in Christ. Now, some people don't want to hear that, too, because some people, uh, you know, like when the, when the Lord took the people out of Egypt, when he took his people out of Egypt, uh, that was one thing, but he had to get Egypt out of them. So some people, when they get saved, okay, great, I made Christ my Savior, uh, and all this is wonderful. They got to realize that you have responsibility, that even though you are on disability or whatever, or you think you're a failure, no, Christ can turn all of that around, and he can use you mildly for God's kingdom. Uh, <laughs> let me go on unless I say it's something I might read. Anyhow. All right, so we're going to look at something in, first of all, Chronicles this morning, First Chronicles. And really, First Chronicles and Second Chronicles was one book altogether. Same way with First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. And in the future, we'll be taking bits and pieces from those books to show you some spiritual insights, one of which we're going to predominantly uh, draw upon is First Samuel, although First Samuel and Second Samuel are one, but I wanted to talk about First Samuel 17. A lot of scriptural principles in there, spiritual warfare, and so on. And but I thought I just can't do that unless we talk about the chapter before that. <laughs> Some of it, you know, don't have to go to every single verse, although we'll read quite a bit uh, when the time comes. But we'll bring out different things, different scriptural principles that when it had started even before Adam and Eve. Uh, when you come right down to it. But uh, right now, let's see what it says over in First Chronicles chapter 23. And what I want to bring out here is, and I'll bring it up on the screen for you, and uh, once again, if I lean for it like this, you know why, okay? I just can't see this stuff. All right, so, and I'm going to bring it up on the screen for you. It's up there on the screen for you right now. And uh, we're going to go there. The reason why we're going there, yeah, this is the Old Testament. Yes, this is the Aaronic priesthood. But we're going to make a point here, as you see the scriptures underneath there, and we'll get to those shortly. But the one highlighted in yellow right now is our main text, 
for this video and the one afterwards. There's, I, I could cram it all into one, but I don't want to do bumps rush. I'm a bump to begin with, so I don't want to do a bumps rush on this. So uh, I want to take my time. I don't want to talk too awfully fast like I'm doing right now, but uh, I want to slow down a little bit and take my time. Uh, we did this at Mount Bay in all one shot, okay? But yet, the, this is reaching out to more people than just the senior citizens and all that. This is reaching out to others. And, of course, my ministry aims also for the edification of the body of Christ. And so, no matter who you are out there. Now, our text is, The sons of Amram, Aaron and Moses, and Aaron was set apart. There you go, separated. He and his sons forever, that he should sanctify the most holy things, to burn incense before Yavah, to minister to him, and to give the blessing in his name forever. Hallelujah. Great ministry. Praise God. Now, so we're going to look at this a little bit here for the message. But we should keep in mind the following. Now, we're not part of the Aaronic priesthood. What are we? Okay. Let's uh, scroll this down a little bit more. Well, I'll go keep it right there. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 11 says, there's a change of priesthood. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, which is Aaron, for under the under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? And, whoa, what's he talking about here? Well, uh, that's mentioned over in Psalm 110.4, which we read later on. I'll read it now to you. It says over Psalm 110, verse 4, Yevah has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever after or according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, why did Yavah say that? Because, well, and this is what uh, the writer of uh, the Holy Spirit brings out in Hebrews, if perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Now, let me go on with this. I'm going to do a little tangent here for you. We have people in the community, and not just in Cambridge, but all over, called the Mormons. They push the Aaronic priesthood. I brought this out to them. I said, you, you, you're, that priesthood has been superseded. They think they, are, they, they belong to the Aaronic priesthood. Ah, do we have a freeze up on the... No, we don't. Okay. Though we might have a little freeze here. But they, they, they claim that they're part of the Aaronic priesthood and they're just bringing this on down to the current generation. They think this is a God. No, they're just fooling themselves because they have not read the whole Bible. In fact, they don't believe the Bible at all, basically, except the parts that agree with them <laughs> and, and all. And would you believe they teach? And this is true. And they're, they don't, uh, they, they come right out and tell you this if you look closely at what they teach. They teach that Jesus and Lucifer were brothers. You know, they have a religion basically like uh, the the uh, Greek mythology and Roman mythology. Zeus had children, all this sort of stuff. No, that's not what we believe at all. We don't believe, you know, God had children like that. Okay. No, this is the spiritual realm. And Christ always existed. He never had a beginning. But uh, anyhow, so the Iraq priesthood evidently was going to be replaced. And uh, a further detail is given in, uh, I have to scroll that down for us, in Hebrews chapter 7. Let me get there myself. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 17 to 19. For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Amen. Praise God. All right, now, he, what the writer of Hebrews is doing by the Holy Spirit, he's pointing at Jesus, okay? And he'll, he'll bring that out in the passages, that he is of the order of Melchizedek, and uh, Jesus supersedes uh, the order of Aaron, and he is the one that we need to follow, not, you know, and so on, etc., and so now we get down to the, once again, that passage I was referring to, pointing to what would happen with Christ Messiah. Psalm 110, verse 4, Yavah has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek 
is an interesting figure. I think he occurs on, uh, what is it? I was going to say Genesis 16, I'm not too sure, in that neighborhood, uh, even before that, perhaps. But uh, he comes out after uh, Abraham, or Abram at that time, he was called Abram, had a great victory over kings that had attacked the area. And uh, Abram, with the help of God and 300 plus other guys, he was able to get back all that was taken. So, uh, interesting stuff. And Melchizedek comes out. I guess what Melchizedek comes out with to greet Abraham. He brings out bread and wine. That's the first time you see bread and wine together in the Holy Scriptures. And what did Jesus do at the Last Supper? He initiated the bread as a symbol of his body and the wine as a symbol as, as blood. Uh, why, was I, why do I say symbol? Because at the Passover, they were having a Passover meal, and the bitter herbs represent their bitter time in Egypt and so on, and there's like three or four other things that were on the plate, you might say, or set before them that they would eat. And those things represented part of the Jewish history. Now, when Jesus picked up the bread and wine, he's identified himself now with Melchizedek, but now he adds these two things to it, basically, and really they supersede uh, basically the other elements of the Passover. The bread representing the body of Christ and the wine representing the blood of Christ. And so, wow. And so, we have all this before us, okay? And so, in Christ, there's this priesthood of Melchizedek. Now, when we look at the scriptures, now, when I started this video, I said that we all have something to do. We always have something to do. And the moment you get saved, now, I didn't know this when I was first saved, you know, at first. After a while, I heard, in fact, I had a very good pastor for the first year, well, for the first four years, basically. He, I went to Bible college after that. A very tremendous blessing that God gave me my first years of salvation. And uh, had a good pastor, went to a good Bible college. Well, it wasn't college at that time, Bible Institute had some great teaching and all, and so, uh, so some great stuff there, and uh, basically, and so uh, after a while, I learned, yes, we belong to a priesthood of believers, and it struck me that my mother, now she wasn't saved at the time, but I, I heard that my mother was hoping I'd be born on Ascension Day, <laughs> and that I would become a priest. <laughs> Well, I wasn't born on Ascension Day, but I did become a priest. Amen. A uh, minister, okay? If you're born again, you are a priest before the eyes of God. You're, you're also a king. And uh, there's scriptures in Revelation that teach us that, but uh, we're going to go to First Peter this morning. Look at that. We're going to overlay this now on the current graphic, and we'll just switch to it right now. Here is First Peter chapter 2, verses 9 to 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have, have obtained mercy. Boy, have we obtained mercy. Praise God. Amen. And with the Holy Spirit's power, we're not, I'm not lifting up. Gentiles or anybody like that, but with the Holy Spirit's power, because the Holy Spirit's been given to us, basically. When I say that, it's not just, you know, I'm not talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, although that's, you should have that, yes. But the Holy Spirit's granted to us in such a way that we now, the scriptures are unlocked to us, and we can bring out stuff that the, <laughs> the Jews had never seen before. Uh, even if we didn't talk about Jesus, we could bring out stuff that the Jews had never seen before. It's right there in the Old Testament. But the Holy Spirit unlocks it for us. But you are a chosen generation. And a lot of people watch out for pride, okay? All right, chosen generation. A royal priesthood, now, or a kingdom of priests. Or priests and kings, you might say. But a royal priesthood. So we're kings and priests before God. And a holy nation. So uh, the fact that we're a royal priesthood. Well, what did, what did the Old Testament priests do? Sit around? They had stuff to do. Now, I read somewhere that their ministry began, I think, at 20 or 30, whatever it was, and they only served 20 years and they retired. 
<laughs> but then again, people didn't live too long back then either. And uh, uh, we live a little bit longer now than what they did. So, uh, but uh, I read that somewhere, and I have to reread that again, get the figures accurate in my head. But it's a whoa, okay? But when you get saved, no, it goes deeper than that, my friend. The moment you get saved, it doesn't matter if you're four or three years old or 40 or 50 or 80 or 90 years old, whatever. Hey, you're, you are now a priest and you got stuff to do. Amen? And it's always wonderful when a little boy or girl that's saved prays for anybody. I like to see that and so on. And uh, that's great. And also senior citizens. Uh, there's one guy in town right now. He is still alive. Physically, I think he was just out at the Dominican Republic again. If I looked at what Scott Politic had, it looked like it. I mean, Scott was down there. I think he's down at DR again. And I uh, saw a picture of Brother Reese out there. So Brother Reese is over 90 years old, right? You know, and so, uh, but he keeps on going. So you, you always have something to do. Don't, don't ever feel like you're worthless. And there's no reason to feel like you're worthless if you're in Christ. You always have something to do, my friend. So bear that in mind. Now, uh, we mentioned the erratic priesthood and the law, basically. Christ is, is the fulfillment of the law. Therefore, just as Aaron and his sons were separated from the rest of the pack, we too are separated. If we're saved and born again, we are separated unto service. Now, we're going to look at that passage again, and let me cut it over to you. And I'm going to have to roll down my screen so we have it before you. Uh, as you see, I'm starting to color code now on our main text. And we're just going to cover those two points this morning because I don't want to rush these things. And I do want to elaborate on some points I did not have a chance to elaborate on at Mallard Bay and so on. I probably elaborated on in Cambridge. But uh, over, once again, we go back to our text now. So we have something to do. So what is it? And we're going to have five things we're going to do two of the five this morning. Aaron was set apart, he and his sons forever, that he should sanctify the most holy things. Now, I have highlighted in light blue, I guess it's light blue, okay, uh, the, uh, the phrase as follows, he and his sons forever. They were separated, he and his sons forever, okay. Now, I place there in part. Well, you, you can't in part. It, it, by the way, if you are if you are sick, you can just impart sickness, okay? <laughs> At all. Uh, but if you are not sick, then you can help. I won't say you can't. Uh, you, you, you don't impart holiness, but you do bring people to a level whereby they understand what the holy is, okay? What is holy? What is most holy? So on. And that's later on, that's also sanctified, but in part. So, uh, he, he in a sense, for what do you mean by this? Okay, first of all, that we are examples, not just to the world, yeah, but also we are examples to all Christians, the next generation of Christians, and so on, and, and all, and uh, we should be examples to them. And, and essentially, uh, sometimes if you are a younger Christian, don't overlook us older Christians, especially if we're active, like myself and a few others. I'm not, I'm not lifting myself up to Cecil Price, that, or that's my wife, she, right here, right? Always witnessing in school, right? And, and trying to, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I'll shut my mouth there, okay? <laughs> but witnessing in school. See, we're what, in our 70s? I'm getting to be 70. Okay? And, uh, but we're still serving the Lord. Uh, on the internet, there's also a, a pastor I used to serve under for a year and a half, or so maybe two years, Cecil Price. He's still rolling, right? And he's had, what, well, COVID twice? You know, look, you listen to him, okay? Uh, I mean, these these guys, even though we're older, we should be an inspiration to the younger, okay? And you guys should tap into us every now and then for, for a little bit of insight. So... Uh, bear that in mind. So examples to the next generation of Christians, right? And the ones that keep on coming. There's new ones all the time. Thank God for that. It doesn't stop. And when we say, but look, it's also new ones that are 60 years old, 70 years old, new ones like that. But it, it doesn't stop. And we are examples. Uh, oh, by the way, let me say this too. 
in a phone call some time back, <laughs> they asked, guy called me, I got a question for you, okay. But, uh, but he, he said, uh, you know, sometimes we put preachers on a, a standard that we should, you know, they, they, we think they have to be better than us. I said, that's, that's scriptural. That's over in First Timothy, Second Timothy. Yes, we should be. If we say that we are the ministers of God, and if we are your pastors and your teachers and so on, well, guess what? We should be ahead of the pack, amen. And we should be examples. So bear that in mind. And we'll. I'll get back on camera soon. I'm so early. But uh, but we should be examples and all that. So. Uh, that every Christian should be an example. We should be examples of what a Christian needs to be right now. So bear that in mind. I, I, right now, I feel so sorry for a person. They've been they've been sidetracked so many times. They've been in, in the shallow part of God's river for so long. Get out of the shallowness and get into the deep, my friend. But we want to be examples. And Let's talk about that now. We're going to switch over to Philippians, and there's a short verse there in Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. Brethren, join in following my example, and note those so walk as you have us for a pattern. There you go. Note those who so walk. You're right. So note them, all right, and follow after them. In I could talk about my personal Christian walk. I guess I'll get back on camera now for a little bit. And uh, so you see that we're still living and live and all that, okay? And so, uh, but in my personal Christian walk, uh, I looked at people that were positive examples. Uh, I mentioned before, one right now, the first one that comes to mind is uh, uh, Brother Sproul. I don't know if he's still alive or not, Brother Howard Sproul. And no one's perfect, but... Uh, a couple of things about him. I saw that he was steady under pressure. Uh, he was the district superintendent of the Potomac District Council of the Assembly of God when I was in it. And steady under pressure. He also had a great, what should I say, self-control. Uh, when it came, we offered him some dessert. <laughs> he denied it twice. Okay. All right. We're not going to push it, you know. And But that was a positive example. So I have seen many, many men and women in the body of Christ that were positive examples. Some exuded just the peace of God all the time. And and I, I'm not just talking about ministers. Uh, you know, Sister D's family is mainly Mennonite. Mennonite, Muna, Mennonite. And not, once again, not everyone's perfect. Not all Mennonites are perfect. But what I noticed with some of those was that they exuded peace so much. Okay? Uh, early on in my Christian walk, when I was an orderly at the... Uh, Google Man I Home. It's now renamed. It's now bigger and better, I guess. Okay. Oh, okay. It was it was just a building that well, I was there with one wing extended, and that was my wing. And then they added another wing after a while. And then it just blossomed from that after that. After I got out of there, it blossomed. <laughs> but, uh, but there was one nurse there, always cool and calm under pressure. If someone would be having a stroke, she knew what to do. No problem. You know, always cool and calm. All right. So, uh, and she's on her internet too right now. Not, I don't know if she's watching this, but, uh, but, uh, uh, what was the first name? Rachel. Rachel. Okay. Yeah. Rachel. All right. Always cool and calm. All right. I got, I had the last current name, <laughs> but I want to say the last name. But, uh, Sister Rachel was always cool and calm. And I was like, whoa, I need to be like that. You know? So you look at that, you know things like that. You know, yeah, you'll have to see the negative and note in such a way, I don't want to be that way. Okay, and then pray for that person, either privately or directly, and uh, that they change. But I look for the positive, man, that's the type of person I want to be. And so uh, after a while, it began to kick in because, see, I was born and raised in northern New Jersey, northeast Jersey. We're always, you know, on the move like that. And when we were pastoring Flintstone, we had a good friend come over and, I guess, preach a couple of times, Bob Wittick. <laughs> I have him in the car with me, and he says something amazing. And as I go in to visit different people, I have him in the car. He says, Pete, you must be a tremendously patient person. What? 
He used to knock knock me for having my thumbs on the horn of a of the car, you know, because New Jersey just honk all the time in New Jersey, you know. So it, you must be a very patient person. But what, you know? But that's the grace of God. You know, you look at the positive and you try to follow through, and God helped me to be that way. Now, this is another thing to impart, uh, not just example, but also foundations in God's Word, and there's a whole lot of them. I'm going to mention about three or four, and so I'm going to put that as an overlay on the screen right now. Okay, and it's going to appear down below, and there it is. Uh, I guess I got it in order. And, uh, First one is that the Holy Bible is, and I don't have this all written down, the Word of God and supreme above everything else. The Holy Bible is the Word of God and supreme above everything else. Now, the Holy Bible, in a good translation, or even, even King James is okay. You want to get better, New King James, and it's Young's that are even better than that, okay? But the Holy Bible, if you got a bad translation, forget it, okay? But I would say King James, I know that's hard to read, get the new King James, it's easier, okay? Uh, but also get Young's Literal Translation, and sometimes the literal's like, what did they say there in the Old Testament? <laughs> Why does the Hebrew say that? And that's good, let it scratch your head, all right? Because you want to ask God, what does that mean? And you knock, and you knock, and you knock, and you seek an answer, and, you know, thankfully I have some help here, with various books about Hebrew and so on, and Greek, many books, uh, and all that I use as reference. But the first one on my list there is that the Holy Bible is the Word of God and supreme above everything else. So no matter what you learned in school, or from other people and all that, this is supreme. Now, it's, but let me clarify that too. It's not a science textbook, but it never disagrees with science. Although science sometimes, you know, makes it look like it does. No, it doesn't, okay? For example, uh, you know, we know that the Earth is just, you know, circling around the sun, basically. Uh, over in Job, is written by the Holy Spirit, who hangs the world on nothing. The, 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 the Holy Bible is so much unlike uh, mythology of the Greeks and uh, the Romans and so on, or even perhaps the Slavs and all that. But... Uh, I say perhaps the Slavs because I, there's not much information on those people. That's my ancestry. And so, but the Holy Bible is so much unlike that. Uh, here's another one, too. Uh, people saying that the, the ancients used to believe that the world was flat. Well, some ancients used to believe that. If you would study that, some ancients believed that. There were some that didn't. The Holy Bible indicated it was round. Okay. About a circuit and so on. You have to read that too. I think that's oh, somewhere in Isaiah. And there's many interesting things in God's Word. Uh, if you say, what about Genesis, God making the earth, well, doing such and such in one day. And I'll keep in mind, the Hebrew word for day there is yom, Y-O-M, and it can mean 24 hours, it can mean 12 hours. It can mean, well, if, if God wanted to, it can mean 12 seconds. But it just means yom, okay, a period of time. And I see nothing absolutely contradictory with what science is trying to promote right now in certain areas. Now, evolution, no, though, all the Garrett saying that we came from amoebas, stuff like that. That is a contradiction, okay. And the Word of God is very clear that we're made, you know, He made each creature after its kind, okay, after its kind. Man was made distinct, even though. <laughs> Uh, there's some some people say we come from apes and stuff like that and all. Uh, no, we are distinct, and that's how God made us. But uh, other than that, other things like that. Uh, besides that, uh, I'll add this: is that neither scientist nor biblical star scholar have all the facts. Okay, we have enough facts just to believe that God did it. That's all that we need. God doesn't have to explain everything to us. Okay, but like over Genesis, about if you notice over in Genesis chapter one. The sun doesn't come around to what? Day four? So like day four. Okay. Where was the sun? And there's all sorts of theories. But if you notice that God said on the first day, let there be light. What's light? Well, when we think of light, we think about something like this picture 
to my left over here that's giving us more light. And oh, that's in this room. But there is light that you and I cannot see. It's called infrared. We can see parts of it, but if it's down too low, we can't see it. It's the same way with sound. Dogs can hear sound, sounds that we can't, right? And uh, so, you know, and so, so here's an example right there. So there's light that we cannot see. In fact, when God said, let there be light, he could have meant the whole electromagnetic spectrum. What do you mean by that? Well, right now, this is being amplified slightly by the system behind us and all that. Uh, it uses electromagnetism for the speaker and so on. Also for the microphone, electromagnetism and all. Uh, your radio waves, you know, electromagnetism. And so basically when God said, let there be light, I really think he, you know, it's like the whole gamut around there, basically. Stuff that we can't see, stuff that we do see, and we just see just a tiny bit uh, and all. And so, but once again, you know, this is supreme above what anyone else says. So uh, the world's going to, the world keeps trying to change it. I think it, what country it was, it was one of the Scandinavian countries that are coming against the Bible big time. And they're going to have trouble. They will have trouble. They'll probably have Russia in their backyard pretty soon. They don't watch out. And uh, so, uh, uh, but they're, they're coming against the Bible. The, the Holy Bible is supreme above everything else, okay? Above everything else. Watching my time here. But I do want to take I do want to take some time on these foundations. Also the exclusiveness of Christ. The exclusiveness the ex exclusiveness of Christ. Christ is the only way to the Father. That's what Jesus said. Now, I had heard reports about the current Pope. I'm not trying I'm not picking on the man, but I'm trying to show you something. I was born and raised Roman Catholic. And as a young Roman Catholic, I was taught that the Roman Catholic Church was the only church that was right, and there's only one way to get to God, that was Jesus Christ. Now, that has been changed. The, the, the unchanging church is changing. They'll, they'll say they're the unchanging church, but they have changed. Even since I, you know, I was a little boy, they've changed. Okay. And the current Pope, I have seen this, uh, and so on. He indicated that all religions tend to point to the same God. Yeah. There's this spirit of that out there like that. And you got to watch that. Be very careful. It's sad to say Billy Graham fell in that trap in his older years. Okay, And evidently his mind was going at that point because Billy Graham was, that's one reason why I got saved. Billy Graham said Jesus Christ is the only way to get to God. He's all God, all man. But then later on I found out sadly that Billy Graham, after he traveled and so on, oh, these other religions are okay. No, they're not okay. No, 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 no. Jesus himself said he is the only way to God. Exclusiveness to Christ also includes the fact that he's all God, all man. There's nothing like him, okay? That's why there's that phrase, only begotten. That doesn't mean he had a beginning. Only begotten is monogenous, the only one of his kind. There's no other being who is all God, all man. Is just Jesus Christ. Amen. He is our way to the Father. Amen. Praise God. So, the exclusiveness of Christ, and then the other one is marriage. Boy, you know that's been taking a beat lately. lately. All right. So, marriage. Yeah, marriage. That's the next. Holiness is last. Then that be last, but that's how I put it because I want to add that too. But marriage has been taking a beating. Uh, in God's plan, it's been monogamy. After Adam sins, you see polygamy comes in there, and then divorce, and it goes on, it just snowballs. And now look at our time. People are mar marrying uh, the same sex. You know, they're marrying animals. <laughs> I told you before, I heard years back about the guy, I think Brazil, some type of mayor down in Brazil. He married a crocodile. I mean, you, you, gotta, you kiss the bride. Snap. You gotta kiss that bride. <laughs> see what happens to you, you know. and uh, you, that might be the last kiss you'll ever have. But it, uh, so, but I'm serious. That's what people are doing. They're so warped. And now you just let, if, if this lets if this is left alone, if we don't, this is what we see as priests. We're to impart. We are to impart to the, this generation of Christians the the seriousness of the the foundations that are here, 
uh, right right here. So on plus more, more than that, and that we gotta hang on them. There's the Sabbath and so on. Don't get that wrong because you know uh, it doesn't mean you gotta be stuck on Saturday. Uh, it, 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 that's another story for another time. But the thing is, is that people need to take a rest. That's one thing. That's for sure. And uh, but like marriage, it the Lord doesn't come back for a while, and if there's no revival, things are going to get really raunchy, okay? And children are going to be, you know, they'll be, you'll be, we'll be have boys, we'll have girls getting pregnant before they're, you know, what, 14, so plus, and all that. And by, by the way, some Muslims do this. They'll go ahead and get a 12-year-old girl, and that's their wife. Terrible. Uh, terrible. Uh, we have sex traffickers that use children for sexual pleasure. I've, heard, I've read some terrible things to it. I don't want to say too much, basically, because it is disgusting uh, what goes on. Just leave the children alone. Just leave them alone. Let them grow up, okay? Oh, and now, and now we got to have uh, Johnny. Well, we're going to call him Johnny. We'll, we'll, this one and that one. Let them choose their gender. And the governor in the Texas. I guess he might have an uphill battle with this one. But uh, he, he's he's come against some of this stuff down there. and uh, But yet, you see, he's trying to bring out a point. This is wrong. You don't gender affirm your child, basically. If, they, if your boy wants to be a girl, that's okay. No, it's not okay. It's warped. It's absolutely warped. And I will call, I will also call it child abuse, too. He called it child abuse. I call it child abuse, too. And not just physical child abuse, but more importantly, spiritual child abuse. You're warping that child's mind and soul. It should not be done. It should not be done at all. So you, you got a baby boy, raise it as a boy. Baby girl, raise it as a girl. There'll, there'll be some hormonal problems with some people every now and then. And, but that's, a, you know, we'll bring it to God. And let him straighten that out, okay? So bear that in mind. But there, ah, so I went from marriage to what? Gender now. See? But this is all rooted in Genesis. It's all rooted in Genesis. Uh, so bear that in mind. And also holiness. That's not brought out all that much nowadays. People don't want to take responsibility. Yeah. Uh, so, but holiness, we're supposed to pursue holiness, not think it's okay for me to have a beer and stuff like that, or sit around and smoke. I have to wonder, I know we're saved by grace, and we're not saved by our works, but if we are saved by grace, we will do the works of Christ, I know that. But I, can't under, I cannot understand, I, 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 I don't know how God's going to work this out. Someone receives Christ as Savior, but they're still puffing away, they're still drinking away, they're still cursing away. And make no effort. To, well, I'll try to change, but don't. After fifty, well, not fifty. After thirty years, it's still the same. Are you kidding? And then they'll sit on a porch out there, having a smoke. I'm saved. What are you doing for Christ? Having a smoke? Go out there, do something for Christ. Pass out tracks. Instead of having a smoke, you know, worship God. And intercede for people. There's a lot to pray about. And that's what we're going to cover in part two, basically, uh, when we get to, you know, interceding. But so there we go. We got we got those foundations. And so I did want to take that time. I'm glad I did. So now we get to the next part, okay, which is sanctify. All right. And this, so we go back to the graphic I have up here for our message this morning and I gotta take something away here. There we go. Alright. So go back to the graphic. That's the next part there. It should be in magenta. That he should sanctify the most holy things. Alright, that's part of our job too. If you're saved, we sanctify the, the most holy things. We point to that which is the most sin. We bring people, we let people know let's not do this. I'm, and it's not just the big things, it's the little things too. What people say on the internet, they, they dabble and jabble and, uh, on the internet and so on. And uh, just different things. Sometime back I said something about Christians talking about underwear. And that's bane. And that's, that's, that's common. Underwear, you know. And, you know, some people don't like that. Uh, but, no, just drop it. Just drop it, okay? And, and all. 
We should we should be talking about things that are above the world, and, and all you know, and you really and and point people to things like that. Also point people to that which is pure. That which is pure. I, last night, every now and then this, this stuff hits me. Post this on your timeline now, and I wrote on there: untrue is not okay, whether it's trivial or not. It just, it just came to my mind because evidently someone might need to see that. And now I'm not a prophet, and I don't claim to be a prophet and all that. But I do. I'll let you know that this stuff will come in my mind now. Then, guys, let's put it on your internet now, and I set up in such a way people cannot comment because sure enough, I'll have a weak Christian or a half-baked Christian come along and debate me on the issue. There's no debate. No debate. Untrue is wrong, no matter how you slice it. So what's pure, true, and sure, right? And my friend, the only thing that's true, sure is God. <laughs> the only thing that's true is God, too, and pure. But uh, but sure, but sure. Now we got the Word of God. That's sure. Word of God in the ancient texts, like I said, get a good translation. New King James, Young Literal. If you got to use King James, that's fine, okay? But so we, we point people to that. And also to that which is approved by God, and we want to bring up now for you, that's the wrong one, we want to bring up for you Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Or approve those things that which are excellent, okay? That's stuff that's approved by God. Eye candy is not approved by God. Yeah. And people say, Oh, you are you approved? Well, go ahead, call me approved. I'd rather be that way. Go ahead, call me approved. Uh, I, I want to pursue holiness because without that, we're not going to see God. And I'm trying to pursue it in Christ, uh, not my own strength. So, but. Oh, we want to prove, you know, well, look, let's back this up a little bit, that your love may abound still more and more what? Your love in what? Denomination or whatever? More, no, your love more and more in knowledge and all discernment. Discernment. You could also say at that point discrimination, not, not race-wise, but discriminate between evil and good, what's best and better, and so on. Things like that. That type of discrimination. Discernment. That you may approve the things that are excellent. That you yourself might be sincere. And without offense to the day of Christ. Now offense in this case does not mean making people angry. You can't make, if people read this in God's word. That means I can't make people angry. No, no, no. It means don't be a stumbling block. That's what that means. Do not be a stumbling block. And But no people want to shirk their responsibility. And they go, oh, I don't want to make people angry. Jesus made a lot of people angry. John the Baptist certainly did, didn't he? Peter, Paul, and I'm sure Timothy did, although we ain't got much writing about that. But as a pastor, I'm sure Timothy and Titus did, so on. People got angry. In fact, at one point, it's assumed that he did, because yeah, Paul, Paul by the Spirit writes to him, you know, rebuke an elder, not rebuke an elder, but uh, rebuke a heretic once or twice, and that's it. That's it. No more after that. <laughs> All right. So we point people to that which is approved by God. Also, what has eternal value. Uh, po politics will not last. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I know there's people. It's, it's nice that people are patriotic and so on. And they, they stand for America and they stand for what they believe. But you know what? America's not going to be around forever. America will not be around forever. So get your mind and heart out of politics and also out of the prophets and into the presence of God. That's another graphic I want to do when he says. I know on the ruffle some photos on that one. But so many Christians are wrapped up in a whirlpool. What that? They're wrapped up in a whirlpool with prophets and with politics. Get out of that whirlpool and get into his presence. All right, so that which has eternal value, that which is truly able to help, okay, 
Uh, let me go back on camera now so you can see my wonderful mug and, and other things too like that. And so, but that which can, that, what, that which really helps. Okay? And so this past week, I felt led to get around finally to do a testimony about healing. Now, I'm not completely healed yet. I still limp, but I've had trouble with my right knee, my right hip, and so on. But it's a whole lot better than it was two years ago, right? You can almost do a jig. Let's see. So, so uh, but what was truly able to help. So what God says to you, that that is able to truly help you and so on. Uh, I don't go, I'm not bragging, but I'm encouraging you, don't seek medication, seek the Lord. I'm not saying don't take medication. I'm saying don't seek it. Okay. Just seek the Lord and what God says to you. And uh, listen to God above your doctor. So look for that testimony. I don't, I don't have it up on YouTube yet. I might put it up on YouTube. I don't know. Also, point people that which brings them to God and not the politics, not the prophets and all that. Uh, so, and also brings people to true life and not spiritual deaths. But you point them to, to, to that. That's how you sanctify, 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 set apart. There's no way you say separate once again, sanctify, set apart. And, uh, in this house, we have oil. Okay? And some is used for anointing, and that's separated from the cooking oil, right? Now, if we had to use the cooking oil, we would, but we've got plenty of anointing oil. So come on by, we'll pray for you. All right. <laughs> But we got lots of anointing oil, okay? And, but that's in a separate bottle. I don't mix the two together. And so, uh, but you, you sanctify things. And also, things that, that brings true life and not spiritual death, that's what we want. And uh, so, stay away from many things. Uh, also, every now and then someone will post something on the internet. Uh, they, that's great. I need to repost that. Most recently was about the Ouija board. And it's not just for one person that did that. I, there's more than one person that says that they're a Christian and they talk to the dead or they miss their mom and dad. And, oh, mom and dad, we wish you a happy birthday. Have a, uh, they stay, no, stay away from that. It's, it's okay to miss them, but don't start talking to them. And so people, you, you, you did that for me. Well, it's not just for you. There's other people out there. It, I don't know how many people watch my timeline. I, I don't know. But I, once again, my ministry is for the entire body of Christ and also for the unsaved. So if, if it's for you, it's for you. If it's for me, it's for me. Okay? And so bear that in mind. So it's not just you. But I, I'm really concerned about a, a cousin that says he talks to the dead relatives. Now. Don't do that. He thinks it's okay. That's because if he's read this Bible, and I don't, I, I, I'm going to ask him, did, did he read the whole thing? Well, that's the Old Testament. It doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, if he read the whole Bible, he doesn't believe it. You know, just take out what you want to believe and follow. That's fine. No, that, it doesn't work that way, my friend. No, no, no. You don't talk to the dead. All right. Don't even try. So we want to bring people to that which is true life and not spiritual death. Our last scripture for this session is over in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. All right, we are partakers of the divine nature. He means the divine war nature. We're, we're, we'll never be omnipotent, okay? <laughs> But when Peter writes that by the Holy Spirit, he's talking about the divine moral nature of Christ, okay? And so we we bring people life by example, and also we teach it also with our mouth and, and also our lives, okay? So bear that in mind. So, friend, if you're saved, you have something to do. Don't sit around 
and do nothing. Watch football games. It's okay, watch one every now and then, whatever. You know, but some people really get into this stuff. They do everything but serve the Lord. And so uh, just you know, understand that if you have time on your hands, it, it's, 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 that's even more important than money. Uh, you want to be good stewards of your time. And so whatever time you have, bring people to Christ, edify the body of Christ and all that. I'm not saying you can't play a little game every now and then, stuff like that. That's okay. But the thing is, is just don't get wrapped up in this stuff at all. You have a purpose, I would. And all. So uh, you have a purpose, and I, I believe every true Christian needs to be at the forefront to witness and also to edify. Witness, edify, witness, edify. Let me pray for you right now. Father, I pray for those that are saved. We ask, our God, that you help each one to take their life of Christ seriously and help them, Lord, to move forward and to spread your word and also to edify others in the body of Christ and also bring others to you. And this we ask in Jesus Christ. Now, if you're not saved, we want you, we would like for you to come to Christ. And once again, someone, I think it was this morning about accepting Christ. That's a nice phrase. In fact, it's a scriptural phrase. But the thing is, you need to understand to accept Christ, that means to surrender. Okay, it's not just, okay, I believe my head. Now, it's a surrender whereby you give your whole life over to Christ. He becomes your king. And so if you're not saved, we would like for you to come and know Christ your Savior. If you'd like to do that, please pray this prayer. I mean, and by the way, once you do that, you'll always have something to do. All right? And you will no longer feel worthless. You'll, you'll feel like you have great value if you come to Christ. But, so you want to do that? So please pray this prayer. I mean, Father, forgive me. I am a sinner. I ask Christ to come in. I surrender all that I am. I give them all, Father. Help me, Lord, with you, I pray. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we go to our prayer request. The first one is from Sri Lanka. A mob of around 600 people broke into Mercy Gate Chapel in Sri Lanka and demanded all religious activities cease and the church be closed. The mob threatened the pastor with death if the worship did not stop. One of the believers was assaulted and later hospitalized due to his injuries. The officer in charge of the local police station told the mob that they had no legal basis to close the church. Pray for protection for this congregation and pray, praise God that the authorities responded appropriately. Pray for the members of this mob to come to surrender their lives to Christ. Lord, I do thank you that uh, even though the mob tried to close the church, thank you that the uh, those that were in charge at the police station, that they told them that they didn't have any right to, to close them. I thank you that uh, you saw fit for this. I just pray that you might uh, help them to continue uh, dealing rightfully when something like this happens, but also I pray for the mob that uh, they might come to know you as their personal Savior. I just pray that you might just convict them. And this we ask in your name and for your sake. Amen. Pakistan. Christians are among the lowest members of the Pakistani society and many do not have access to discipleship opportunities to grow in their faith. Working long hours in restricted areas as servants in wealthy households or toiling away in brick kilns, these brothers and sisters have little access to biblical instruction and Christian fellowship. Some Pakistani pastors have begun traveling to these restricted areas to encourage and build up the body of Christ. Though they face opposition and put their lives at risk to minister in these areas, uh, these faithful servants of the Lord are advancing God's kingdom, carrying Bibles to these isolated believers and preaching God's word to them. Pray for these pastors to be encouraged as they serve in these difficult circumstances and pray for their safety as they travel to minister in dangerous areas of Pakistan. And Father, we do pray for these pastors that you encourage them and also encourage those that listen to them and meet the needs there and may more be brought up, or raised up to be this little army for your own glory. And we pray for the safety that you direct them, Lord, and meet the needs there and, uh, and protect them, Father. And we pray that you just give them inroads more and more deeper into Pakistan areas, Pakistan areas that are neglected. 
And this we ask in Jesus Christ. Amen. We also pray for Ukraine, that the war stops out there. And we pray that Putin, or the Lord, would just put down the weapons and all that. And just behave. And this we ask in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, before we go, I forgot. But that's okay. Maybe we just do it differently. I mentioned that if you are safe, we have two things for you on the internet. First of all, we have Recording Tile Service for Growth of Christ. That's at my uh, Sapphire Streams pages. You'll find that link there and on many of my Sapphire Streams pages and also at archive.org. So look for that link there. It's called Seven Roots for Growth of Christ. Seven Roots for Growth of Christ. Also, we have on the internet for you a series of lessons titled Basic Elms Christianity. That's at sapphirestreams.com forward slash BEC forward slash all lowercase letters. Take those lessons. They're free. And uh, you don't have to log in. You don't need a password. They're all free. Once again, we're Cornerstone Assembly Independent Pentecostal. If you're in the area, come on out for a service tonight at 7 p.m. at 415 Cannabis Street at Church Called the River at Sanctuary 2. And also this Thursday uh, for our study in uh, Psalm 119. We'll continue with that this Thursday at 7 p.m. So glad you could join us, and may God richly and wonderfully bless you. You who dwell in the gardens, the companions listen for your voice. Let me hear it. Maranatha! 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 Maranatha!